I was in the room when Luke and Ava got to see that for the first time on the big screen, and they were very excited that they are now famous actors. Uh, pretty cool. Uh, so how many of you have ever participated in a white elephant gift exchange? Anyone ever participated? Okay, lots and lots of us have participated. Uh, just in case you're not familiar with uh, the unique specifics of a white elephant gift exchange, it's basically like any other normal gift exchange where everyone brings a gift and puts them in a pile and everyone picks from that pile. But the difference between a normal gift exchange and a white elephant gift exchange is that in a normal gift exchange, usually you exchange normal gifts. You know, you'll bring a, a Starbucks gift card or a fuzzy blanket or a Yeti tumbler or something like that. But in a white elephant gift exchange, the gifts are not normal gifts. In fact, in a white elephant gift exchange, the general rule is the stranger the gift, the better the gift. Yeah. So uh, I've seen people get toilet seats. I've seen people get live goldfish. I've seen people get uh, jazzercise videos on VHS. I've even seen people get a leg lamp from the, the movie A Christmas Story. And then a, a few years ago, one of the guys on our staff team brought this beauty uh, to our staff Christmas party. It was all wrapped up in a box and nobody knew what it was. And we're like, is there a body in there? Like what in the world is going on? And we finally opened it and we saw this. And that was a year that I think the Seahawks were actually a little better than they are this year. And so they put a Seahawks t-shirt on it and uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So this is kind of a classic example of a white elephant gift exchange gift. It's like bizarre and a little strange and a little weird. And I got to tell you this really quick story. So somehow this, this guy, my buddy here, ended up, this feels so weird. Um, <laughs> This guy ended up back on our campus and was stashed kind of in like a, this little back section behind one of the other rooms on our campus called, uh, uh, called the family room. And it was tucked back behind there. And uh, one, one night, this, this place kind of gets creepy at night, like when no one is here and it's all, it's all dark. So it was like 10 o'clock at night. Um, I was the last one on campus and I was going around shutting lights off and making sure that everything was locked up. And I came around the corner and it was dark and I ran into this guy. I freaked. He used to have a head. I took it off. I was so freaked out. If you've ever had something like that, it was, it was creepy. So anyway, this is kind of a classic example of a white elephant gift exchange gift. And that's what's fun about a white elephant gift exchange because you never quite know what you're going to get. When you open it up, you never quite know what's going to be uh, in the package. It's always a surprise. And if you think about it, that's kind of like the Christmas story in the Bible. And what I mean is it's full of surprises. It's full of, of people and events and details that you just wouldn't expect. And that's part of what makes the nativity of Jesus one of the most beautiful stories in all of human history. And so this morning, we're going to kick off a brand new series of talks that we're actually calling White Elephant. And for the next three weeks, we're going to unwrap some of the surprising gifts that are contained in the Christmas story. In fact, if you're up for it, I thought we could have a little bit of fun with this whole white elephant theme. And so if you're up for it and you want to participate, this is what I'm going to invite you to do. Next week, when you come to church, if you're here with us on campus, then bring a white elephant gift. Wrap it up. It could be something bizarre. It could be something cool. It could be something a little bit strange. Wrap it up. Bring it. Drop it off under the tree in the lobby. And then on your way out of church after the service is over, pick up a gift um, from under the tree. And you never quite know what you're going to get. You can take that home. And if you want to rewrap what you got and bring it back the next week and just keep recycling, that's fine too. But we'll do this for a couple of weeks and we'll just have a little bit of fun with it. I might even ask you during the service sort of what you got last week and you can raise your hand and tell me what bizarre, crazy stuff you got and what you brought. And we'll just have a little bit of fun with it. Sound good? We're okay? Okay. All right. So this morning we're going to start by unwrapping the surprising gift story of an unlikely couple who gave birth to their firstborn son in a little town in Judea over 2,000 years ago. And the birth of this little baby boy was predicted by angels, was prophesied by Old Testament prophets like Isaiah and Malachi, and the baby's name was Yohanan. What? You might know him better as John the Baptist. But long before he was known as John the Baptist, he was simply John the Miracle Baby. 
born to an elderly couple who had given up hope that they would ever have a child. And in Luke's gospel, the story of John's miraculous birth is beautifully woven into the nativity of Christ. And so for the next few minutes, we're going to unwrap one of the surprising gifts in the Christmas story by looking at the remarkable birth of John the Baptist. So if you have your Bibles uh, or a Bible app, I'm going to invite you to turn to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 1. As you turn there, and as we get ready to read together, we'll have it on the screen as well, and so you'll be able to read it there if, if, if you prefer. Um, but uh, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna pick this up in Luke chapter 1, verse 5, and I want you to pay really close attention to the way that Luke starts this section. And I want you to notice that he doesn't start this section with the words, once upon a time in a land far, far away. Now, this is important because we're going to read some details in this story that honestly, if you have a rational mind like most of us do, the details in this story seem pretty far-fetched and seem pretty unrealistic and maybe a bit fantastical, especially to modern readers. But I want you to notice that Luke doesn't start his text with the language of myth or the language of, of legend or the language of fairy tale. He starts with the language of historical fact. He firmly roots this story in a specific time period, in a specific location. Luke is a well educated historian who records the who, what, when, and where of these events with historical precision and accuracy. And he begins by writing In the time of Herod, king of Judea. There was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive and they were both very old. Once, when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Let's pause there for just a, a moment. I want to say a couple of things about this section. We're going to kind of continue reading all the way through um, this section on John the Baptist, but I want to pause a couple of times and point out some things. Uh, let me say a couple of things. First of all, this whole idea of priests. In those days, you didn't just decide to become a priest. Uh, you know, you weren't in high school and you're kind of trying to figure out what you want to be when you grow up. And, you know, do I want to be an airline pilot? Do I want to be a nurse? Do I want to be a firefighter? Eh, maybe I'll be a priest. That kind of wasn't the way it worked. You would actually become a priest because you were born into a priestly family. Your father or grandfather or great-grandfather had been a priest and you were born into this priestly ancestry. That doesn't mean that you had to become a priest, but that, those were the only people that could become priests were those who were born in this ancestral line of Aaron, the brother of Moses. Um, priests, so kind of different than like maybe our Catholic uh, uh, idea or understanding uh, of a priest. Priests served in the temple in the city of Jerusalem, kind of the central hub of the religious activity um, of the Israelite population that was spread all over the ancient world. But these priests would come to the city of Jerusalem and serve in this magnificent temple um, that Solomon had built and then Herod, King uh, Herod, had actually rebuilt. Um, and at the time, there were way more priests than they actually needed. There was like 20,000 priests in this area. And so it was way too many for them to all be at the, the temple serving at the same time. So they served on kind of a rotation. And there were 24 different priestly divisions. And uh, Zechariah, as the text indicates, was part of one of those priestly divisions. Um, and it was a pretty good gig. Um, you know, you served a couple of times throughout the year, um, plus some festivals. You had a pretty good income. You were pretty well respected in the community. So it was a, a pretty good gig. It's also worth noting that not only was Zechariah a priest, but he was married to Elizabeth that Luke indicates was born of a priestly line. She was actually from the priestly line of Aaron. And so uh, the two of them being married was actually kind of a big deal in that day. A priest and a woman who had been descended from priests marrying together. Wow, that's a pretty special family. So that was was kind of a big deal in that sort of cultural moment. But Luke points out they had never been able to have children. 
And by the time we pick up the story, Zechariah and Elizabeth were well past childbearing age. Uh, Verse 7 says that they were very old. Now, if I took a poll and asked you the question, what constitutes very old? (laughs) Dale, what would you say? 77. How old are you? 77. (laughs) He says, very old is 77 because I know what it feels like and it feels very old. But you remember, you know, when you're six, seven, eight, first grade, second grade, third grade, then your teacher's probably, what, 30 years old and you think, wow, she's old, right? I mean, you know, old, very old is just kind of, contextualized based on however old we are, right? And so however old we are, a few years older than that, I don't know, that just seems really, really old. And so we don't know exactly how old Zechariah and Elizabeth were, but they were old enough that Luke tells us that they were very old and they were not just past childbearing age, but well past childbearing age. So you can kind of pick in your mind some sort of an age range and kind of come up with an imagination of what you think uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth might have looked like and how old they might have been. But on this particular day, Zechariah the priest had been chosen to burn incense in the interior of the temple, not just serve at the temple or around the temple or sacrifice uh, um, but, but to actually go inside the temple and serve in a place called the holy place. And he was going to go inside and offer um, incense, which would happen twice a day. And this was a significant honor for a priest. And it might only happen like once in his lifetime. So Zechariah had traveled to Jerusalem. He lived kind of out in the outskirts in the outside of, uh, of Jerusalem. And it traveled into Jerusalem, and at the appointed time, he went into the interior of the temple in order to present, uh, to burn the incense. He went into the section called the holy place, and he waited for the signal. He waited for the signal that it was time to offer the incense. And in those days, devout Jews around the city of Jerusalem three times a day would come to the temple and would enter into the temple courts and would pray for a few minutes three times every day. And so as Zechariah went inside to offer the incense and the people prayed outside waiting for the puff of smoke that would demonstrate that the incense had been offered. And as the people were outside praying, that is when something very unexpected happened to Zechariah. We pick it back up in verse 11. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, appeared to Zechariah, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and he was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Easy for you to say. (laughs) Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. And he will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and the power of Elijah." to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Let's stop there for a minute. So if you've spent much time around the Bible, you know that that when we read about an angel appearing in the Bible, um, it doesn't really surprise us all that much because angels are popping up all the time in the Bible, right? So when we get to a part where, oh, here's another angel, another angel is speaking to somebody, another angel shows up in the middle of, you know, in the middle of a, a, a regular day, we read that and we go, yeah, it's kind of par for the course for the Bible. Um, but This didn't happen all the time. This wasn't normal. In fact, you can tell it wasn't normal by Zechariah's response. Um, If you look at verse 12, Luke tells us that when the angel appeared, Zechariah was startled and he was gripped with fear, which is a polite way of saying that he was freaked the heck out, right? He's in here and all of a sudden an angel is speaking to him. So he's as freaked the heck out as you and I would be if right in the middle of the worship set, in the middle of the church service, an angel appeared and just started speaking to us. You and I would be freaked out as was Zechariah. And the angel tells him four things. He says, do not be afraid. He says, you and your wife Elizabeth are going to have a child. He says, your name, or his name will be John. And we're going to come back to the significance of that name in just a minute. And then he says some cryptic words about someone named Elijah and, and, and something about preparing the people for the Lord. 
And the words that the angel speaks here, those, that, those kind of phrases at the end that seem a little bit kind of cryptic to us, these words are very similar. In fact, they're borrowed from a couple of really important Old Testament prophecies uh, out of the book of Malachi, which is the last book of the Old Testament right before you get to Matthew, the the first book in the New Testament. And this book of Malachi, or these prophecies were uttered about 450 years before Luke's gospel. And this is no accident. Luke doesn't accidentally include these words in his description of the angel's words. The angel doesn't accidentally use these words to describe what John is going to do. Luke is intentionally connecting John's birth back to these Old Testament prophecies. And I want to show you on the screen just kind of the overlap. So just a moment ago, we read verses 16 and 17. He will bring many of the people back to Israel, to the Lord their God, and he will go before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents of their children, the dis- disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And then you look over in the column next to that at a couple of prophecies towards the end of the book of Malachi, and you see some similarities, right? It will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Malachi 4, 5, and 6 says, see, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents. So not only does this angel appear to Zechariah in the temple and sort of freak him out, but the stuff that he's saying to Zechariah is blowing Zechariah's mind. Because Zechariah would have been very familiar with the prophet Malachi. He would have been very familiar with what Malachi had said. Malachi was the last prophet of the Old Testament. There had been almost there had been more than 400 years of silence since one of the prophets of God had spoken and written. And so the people were waiting for the Messiah to arrive and they were rehearsing rehearsing these ancient prophecies, looking ahead to the day that the Messiah would arrive. And so Zechariah as a priest would have absolutely been familiar with Malachi. And as the angel speaking, he's picking up on these phrases and these words, and it would have blown his mind. Because not only does uh, the angel tell Zechariah that he's going to have a son, which he doesn't even believe, but he tells Zechariah that his son is actually somehow going to be connected back to this ancient prophecy and that he is somehow going to play a role in preparing the people of Israel for the coming of the Messiah. And this was mind-boggling for Zechariah. And this is what I mean about the Christmas story. It's filled with surprising and unexpected events and moments like this. And so here's Zechariah in the temple. The the angel is speaking to him. He's trying to wrap his mind uh, around these. And so he asks the angel this. He asks the angel, how can I be sure of this? I mean, come on, like, I don't know if you noticed, but I'm an old man and and my wife is well along in years. And so the angel responds and said to him, I am Gabriel and I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not be able to speak until the day that this happens because you did not believe my words, ultimately God's words, which will come true at their appointed time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah. Now remember, there were all these people out in the courtyard praying, sort of waiting for the priest to come back out. So they're all waiting um, and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized that he had seen a vision in the temple because he kept making signs to them, but he wasn't able to speak. Verse 23, when his time of service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant, and for five months she remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace from among the people. Let's stop there for a sec. So Zechariah comes out of the temple after his encounter with the angel. He has this little game of charades where he tries to communicate with the people because he can't talk now. And then he goes home and his wife, who was very old and well past the age of childbearing, is finally miraculously able to conceive. And it's right here in the story, if you're following along, that Luke sort of jump cuts over to the story of a young woman named Mary. And this is where we have the the story of Jesus's birth and John the Baptist's birth kind of laid side by side. Um, And and, and the same angel, Gabriel, that appeared to Zechariah now also appears to Mary and promises her that she's going to become pregnant, but not with an ordinary child, 
She was going to give birth to the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior, the Son of God. And it's in that moment that we find out, actually, in that description, we find out that Mary and Elizabeth, the wife of Zechariah, are actually relatives. And in verse 39, we read that Mary actually goes to visit Elizabeth, and we pick it up there in verse 39. In verse 39, we read this, at that time, Mary, who is now also pregnant, got ready and hurried into a town in the hill country of Judea where she entered Zachariah's home and she greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby that was inside of her leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women and blessed is the child that you will bear. But why am I, Elizabeth said, so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? And as soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb, Elizabeth said, leaped for joy. Let me just stop and say this. I think it's so important for us to appreciate the fact that one of the first people to recognize Jesus as Lord was an unborn child. She continues, blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promise to her. So Elizabeth and Mary have this, this moment of greeting and it's beautiful and the Holy Spirit is at work and there's babies leaping and kicking and all excited. And any of you that have ever carried a baby, you know that that's normal. Sure, the baby's gonna kick and sure, a baby's gonna move. But there was something going on in this moment that for Elizabeth, she's like, this isn't normal. Something is happening right now that isn't normal. I've had the baby kick before. This is not just the baby kicking. And there's something happening in this moment. And so Mary stays with Elizabeth for three months and then she returns home and Elizabeth is getting ready those sort of final weeks and final days before the baby's going to arrive. And then we get to my favorite part of the story. In verse 57, when it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbor's and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, no, his name is to be called John. They said to her, there's no one among your relatives who has that name. Let's stop there for just a second. How many of you, uh, your name is, is borrowed from uh, someone in your family, an ancestor, a father, a grandfather, a grandmother, a mother? Okay, a number of us. Not all of us. Mine is, uh, my dad's name is Edward. My middle name is Edward. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I'm not Edward Jr., but my middle name is Edward. So it's a common practice. It's called patronymy. It's the, um, the, the act, particularly when it's a, a male child being named after um, his father. Um, and uh, so, so it's not, it wasn't mandatory in those days, but it was very common. Um, and so they had in mind to name this little baby, Little Zach, right? We got Big Zach, and we're going to name him Little Zach, right? We got Big Zachariah, we got Little Zachariah, and so we'll have Big Zach. Zach and, and little Zach, and, and, and the family is all there, and if you've ever been around family, and family has lots of input and lots of strong opinions about what you ought to do, this is one of those moments, right, um, where everybody has an idea of what you ought to name your child and what you ought to do with your children. Yes, this is one of those moments, um, but Elizabeth says, no, he will be called John. But the family that had gathered for this important moment wanted a second opinion, and so they turned to Zechariah to get his input. And in verse 62, they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. He asked for a writing tablet, and a writing tablet in those days would have been a, a, a piece of wood with some wax on it. You would take a stylus, and you would write an imprint on the wax, and so they had these writing instruments, and then you could kind of like smear the wax again and rewrite over it, so it was kind of a way of being able to, to read, kind of like our post-it notes or a whiteboard or something like that, um, and so he, he got this writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. Now, John's a pretty common name in English. In Hebrew, it's not pronounced John, it's pronounced Yohanan. And that word is a compound word that means Yahweh, or the Lord, is gracious. 
This is one of the few times in the Bible where God himself names someone before they were born. There's a few other examples. Isaac is one of them. Jesus is certainly one of them. Even Solomon is one of them. It doesn't happen very often, but when God names a child and says, this is the name, it's a pretty significant detail that we ought to pay attention. And for some reason, God wanted this baby's name to, 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 to evoke the idea that Yahweh, the Lord, is full of grace, that Yahweh is gracious. And so they named the child Yohanan. And immediately, this is verse 64, his mouth, Zechariah's mouth was open and his tongue set free and he began to speak, praising God. All the neighbors were filled with awe and throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all of these things. Hey, did you hear? Hey, did you see? Yeah, I was there. It was crazy, right? They're all talking about it. And everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, what then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was on him. And friends, this is Luke's account of the birth of John the Baptist. And this story is woven intentionally into the middle of the birth story of Jesus. And it's a beautiful story filled with surprising details and remarkable, miraculous, mind-blowing events. But it's so important for us to remember that this is not a story about John. It's not a story about Zechariah or Elizabeth or an angel or a prophecy or even a miraculous pregnancy. This story is a story about God. This is a story about a faithful God who fulfills his promises to his people and who was about to do something amazing in the middle of the course of human history. And so the temple and the priests and the incense and the angel, they're all pointing our attention to God. The prophecies, the miraculous birth, the name given to John, the Lord is faithful and gracious. All of those details pointing our attention to God. In fact, everything about John's birth and everything about his life and everything about his ministry that we read in the subsequent chapters of the Gospels are all intended to point to God and to prepare the way for the arrival of Jesus the Christ. And I want to spend just the last few short minutes talking about that idea. The idea that John came to prepare the way for Jesus. And so here's the question that I want to ask you. Are you prepared for Christmas? I don't mean are you ready for Christmas? Like, do you have your lights up and, and presents under the tree and an ugly sweater for the office Christmas party? <laughs> And that's not what I mean when I ask the question, are you ready uh, or are you prepared for Christmas? I mean, are you prepared? Is your heart prepared for Christmas? Like, is your heart prepared to respond to the incredible reality that God himself took on human flesh and lived among us in order to rescue us and redeem us and reconcile us to the Father? Because that's the reality of Christmas, right? And I don't know about you, but I bet I'm not the only one. But every single year, and I promise myself I'm not going to do this, but every single year I find myself swept up into all of the traditions and all of the decorating and all of the busyness and all of the shopping and all of the parties. And I promise myself I'm not going to. I promise myself that I'm going to keep my eyes fixed on Jesus. But, but everything kind of starts crashing in and picks me up and carries me along. And I'm just sort of caught up in the, the waves and the wind of the, of the Christmas sort of cultural moment. Uh, and, and as a parent, I spend all this time sort of getting the house ready and figuring out what to get uh, our kids and how to pay for it without having to sell one of my kidneys on the black market, right? In fact, just, just last night, uh, Katie, I saw you, right, at Snapper Jacks, right? So I, I saw you there. Um, we went to Snapper Jacks, and then afterwards, we went across the street to the, 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 the Christmas tree lot, and we walk onto the Christmas tree lot to look for a Christmas tree, and one of my sons who was there goes running over to the first tree that he sees. He's like, Dad, this tree is awesome. We should get this tree. And I walked over to it, and as a dad, I looked at, what did I look at first? The price tag, right? So I looked at the price tag, $1,800. I am not joking. It was this huge, massive, noble fur. I'm like, son, I promise you, we are not going to buy an $1,800 Christmas tree. 
And so we sort of get caught up in all of the we need to and we should and we should be able to and how come we can't and how come we can't keep up and how come we can't do what they do and I want to get it big enough to, you know, to make up for yeah, all these things we sort of get caught up into. And listen, there's nothing wrong with putting lights up. There's nothing wrong with decorating. There's nothing wrong with putting a Christmas tree up or giving gifts or traditions. I just feel like every single year, those things end up being the main thing that I end up focusing on. My time and my energy and my money and my focus and my thoughts and my stress and my anxiety, all of it sort of like focusing on all of this stuff. And every year those things block and obscure and distract me from being able to respond to the reality of the incarnation of Jesus the Messiah and the wonder and the awe that that reality ought to inspire in me. And the story of John the Baptist reminds me to prepare. Not to just sort of be ready, but to be prepared, to actually take the time to prepare. That word prepare in the scriptures was used of getting the roads ready or preparing a city for the arrival of a king. They would send envoys ahead to announce the king is coming, the king is coming. And there'd be all this effort and work to make sure that the roads were, 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 were flat and, and prepared, um, that there was decorations up, that whatever the color the king liked was up, you know, hanging, that everything was ready and prepared for the king. And so this word prepare has, has some work involved in it, some preparation. I'm, I'm to prepare myself. In fact, in the first few lines of Mark's gospel, he quotes the prophet Isaiah and he says this about John the Baptist. He says, this is God speaking through the, 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 this prophecy. I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare the way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight the paths for him. And according to the gospel writers, John's miraculous birth and enigmatic ministry was intended for one specific purpose, and that was to prepare people for Jesus. So this Christmas, my hope is that the surprising story of John the Baptist continues to prepare people for Jesus. So here we are on December 5th, and before we get too distracted by all that needs to be done in order to be ready for Christmas, we're going to take time to pause. We're going to take time to slow down. We're going to take time to take a deep breath, to contemplate, to reflect, and to prepare our hearts for the earth-shattering reality that the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. In just a minute, we're going to receive communion. But before we do that, I want to encourage you to do something. This is something that I'm going to encourage you to do at home, and then we're going to do something together. M many of you, maybe not all of you, but many of you probably have a nativity set at home. If you don't have one, I would encourage you to buy one really cheap on Amazon. You can even make one, cut one out out of paper, um, print out a picture and set it down. Um, but, but I would encourage you to have some sort of nativity set in your home. A little Joseph, a little Mary, uh, a little baby in a manger, just as sort of a visual reminder. And again, many of you already have that. If you don't have that, though, I just encourage you to, to find one, build one, buy one, get one somehow. Put it in a prominent spot in your apartment, in your room, uh, in your home. Put it somewhere that you're going to see it. And then if you have a Bible, I'm going to encourage you to open that Bible up to the book of John chapter 1 and just leave it open right there in front of that nativity set. And every time when you're running in with the groceries or you're sitting down doing homework or uh, you're cooking in the kitchen um, or you, you're rushing on your way out to get to work in the morning, any time that you spot that nativity set and that Bible is open, and if you don't have an actual paper Bible, maybe you use your phone, you can just write out the, the words to John 1.14, that the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. Just write that down on a little post-it note and just put it right there in front of that nativity set. And every time that you walk past that, just stop for just a moment. It's not just one more decoration in your house like the tree and the gnomes and the elves and the whatever. Stop for a moment in front of that nativity set, even if it's just three little pictures, 
Even if it's just four little, three little squares, one that says Joseph, one that says Mary, and one that says Jesus, and you got three post-it notes, that's fine. Pause there. Take a moment. Read the words of John 1.14. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Just pause for a moment. Reflect on the reality of the incarnation before you move on into whatever else it is that you have to get done. And may we begin to prepare our hearts for the reality of the incarnation of Jesus that Christmas reminds us of over and over every year. So this is what we're going to do. This morning, we're going to receive communion. And we're going to build into this time of communion a moment to pause, to think, to reflect, to feel, to pray. And so if you are in the building, I'm going to invite you to go ahead and take your communion elements and just peel off the top little cellophane layer and kind of have it ready. We're going to pause a moment before we actually take the, the, the wafer, but, but I just want you to have it ready. And if you're joining us from home, uh, it's a great time to hit pause. Go grab a little cracker, a piece of bread, and something to drink and have it ready. And we're going to receive communion together. And what I want you to do with these elements in your hand is I want you to just pause. Our church services often are much like our lives. They're busy, they're noisy, they're loud. And so we're going to create a, a mini sanctuary in this place. And we're going to pause. We're going to close our eyes. And we're just going to think for a moment on the reality of God becoming flesh. Jesus, the Messiah, born as a baby grows, ministers, teaches, serves, sacrifices, dies, and is resurrected. And we're just going to pause for a moment and reflect on that. So just go ahead and do that. We'll take a minute and then we'll receive the elements together in just a moment. I don't know about you, but I'm often easily distracted. <laughs> a one or two minute pause in the middle of a church service and my mind often starts to wander. It's, this is one of the reasons that communion is so important to us because for those of us who are kinesthetic learners, I gotta, I gotta have something, I gotta touch something, I gotta see something, I gotta hear something, I gotta feel something, I've gotta, I've gotta, I, 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 my senses have to be involved in order for me to sometimes stay engaged. It's one of the reasons uh, uh, of communion is it's a way of our whole body taking in the reality and the truth and the significance of Jesus' incarnation, his death, and his resurrection. And so I'm just going to invite you to take the bread and I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. That Paul writes this, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup and he said, this cup, this represents the new covenant, the new agreement in, in my blood. So do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's drink together.
Paul says, for when, Paul quotes Jesus, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Friends, would you stand to your feet as we close in prayer? Just before we sing a portion of a song that we sang at the end, I want to pray for us. Lord God, would you help us to prepare our hearts? Because we know enough about ourselves, whether we're here and we're five or six or seven, or whether we're in that category of Zechariah and Elizabeth, very old. God, we just recognize our own tendency to forget, to be distracted, to be disrupted, to have our view and our sight of you obscured by so many other things, especially during this season, as hard as we try not to. It's obscured by our loneliness, distracted by our busyness, frustrated by our, our financial concerns, excited about gifts and parties. God, in the midst of all of that, would you continue to speak to us and continue, as you did through John, to prepare us for the reality of the incarnation of Jesus the Christ, our Savior, our Lord. I ask this now in that name above every other name, that name of King Jesus. Amen.